going to demonstrate the recta sheath using uh, different colored post-it notes. This is the left side of the recta sheath. The recta sheath exists bilaterally. On this side is the midline. And I've written here linea alba, means white line. The linea alba is formed by the, formed by the interdigitations of the aponeuroses of the external oblique, internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis. At the top here is going to be superior. This is going to be inferior. So remember, this is the left side. Linea alba represents the midline. I've got the rectus abdominis here represented by pink paper. I've got the external oblique aponeurosis represented by this blue-green paper. And consider that all the aponeuroses are bilaminar or have two layers. So I've given each aponeurosis two layers of post-it notes. The yellow represents the internal oblique aponeurosis, and I've particularly labeled its anterior half and its posterior half. And then deep to that is the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis. And again, that's two layers. I'm going to tuck the rectus abdominis in its rectus sheath and then uh, explain how it is snuggled in its sheath or how the sheath is formed around it. This rectus sheath is an incomplete sheath, meaning that it doesn't completely envelop the rectus abdominis. You could think of it kind of like an envelope, but the envelope would be incomplete. So how is it incomplete? So if we think of this, these aponeuroses as surrounding the rectus abdominis um, anteriorly and posteriorly or superficially and deep, how it's incomplete is that the posterior or deep wall of the rectus sheath is incomplete. So let me just kind of quickly show you that the rectus abdominis is completely covered anteriorly. So here's its anterior wall. And there's the rectus abdominis. So this is the anterior wall or the superficial wall of the sheath. And if I move the rectus abdominis out of the way, take it out. There's the posterior wall, but there's no posterior wall here. Notice there's no post-it notes. So how is the rectus sheath incomplete? It only has a posterior wall, um, only has a partial posterior wall. So it is here, but not down here. And in fact, the end of the posterior wall that I'm pointing to right here, the end of that posterior wall is called the arcuate line. And that's visible on the cadaver. You have to reflect the rectus abdominis. You could cut it in half transversely, reflect, reflect a piece superiorly, reflect a piece inferiorly, and then look on the po what you think is the posterior wall. You'll notice it's thicker here, denser, you know, kind of whitish, and then there'll be an end to that texture or that color, and that's the arcuate line. And inferior to that down here, where there's no posterior wall, the tissue layer will be a different color. So the what is the arcuate line? The arcuate line is the end. It's the line showing the end or the inferior edge of the posterior wall. So let's tuck the rectus abdominis back in and see how those walls are formed.
So there, I've put the rectus abdominis back in, and I'm going to put the anterior wall back. So, we're going to talk about the anterior wall and the posterior wall relative to that arcuate line. Remember where that arcuate line is? It's the end of the posterior wall. So, superior to the arcuate line, the anterior wall of the sheath is formed by both layers of the external oblique aponeurosis and the anterior one-half of the aponeurosis of the internal oblique. And peekaboo, we see the rectus abdominis. I'm going to do that again. The anterior wall of the sheath, superior to the arcuate line, is formed by the external oblique aponeurosis and the anterior one-half or the superficial one-half of the aponeurosis of the internal oblique. And there's the rectus abdominis. Inferior to the arcuate line, the aponeuroses of all three, the aponeuroses of all three, the external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis are all anterior. So here's the here's the external oblique aponeurosis reflecting it, internal oblique aponeurosis reflecting that and the transversus abdominis aponeurosis, so I left out the word abdominis, and reflect that, and peekaboo, we can see the rest of the rectus abdominis. So inferior to the arcuate line, the anterior wall of the sheath is thicker than the anterior wall of the sheath superior to the arcuate line. Why is it thicker? It's got the aponeuroses of all three of those muscles, external oblique, internal oblique, and transversus abdominis. And you can't, in the cadaver, you cannot separate those layers. They're adhered to each other. So let's reflect the rectus abdominis again, or I'm going to take it out. And we're going to look at what forms the posterior wall. So remember, this is the arcuate line, the end of the posterior wall. So the only place there's a posterior wall to the sheath is superior to the arcuate line. So it's formed by the other half of the internal oblique aponeurosis and the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis. To repeat, the posterior wall of the rectus sheath is incomplete. It ends at the arcuate line and this posterior wall is formed by half of the internal oblique aponeurosis and then the transversus abdominis aponeurosis. And in, oopsie, <laughs> inferior to the arcuate line, there is no posterior wall to the sheath. I've put the rectus abdominis back in its incomplete envelope or incomplete sheath. So I hope that was helpful. I, I recommend, if you thought this was helpful, to make one yourself.